Last Sunday I talked about that there are many different things that we could devote our lives and time and energies and so on to. And we left off talking about how all those things are okay in moderation, but what we should really be focusing our time and energy and um, thoughts to is just one thing. And that one thing is made up of many facets. And we're going to look at two of those facets today. That one thing, of course, as we talked about last Sunday, could be summed up with these words, and that is devotion to God. That is the one thing that we should focus our lives upon. The one thing that we should be wrapped up in is devotion to God. And we're going to look at two things, like I said today. First of all, though, I want to do a little uh, checkup on you. So last Sunday, I told you that I was going to do something, right? I was going to listen to two sermons before I listen to any podcasts, and I did it. So accountability here. I did what I said I was going to do, and I plan to continue that. And I'm just wondering, actually, I listened to three because I listened to my own, and then I listened to, to two other ones as well. So anyway, um, don't answer the question, but what did you do, right? Because I challenge you to think of something, well, just one thing that you could do to improve on your Christian walk, and what might that be? So if you didn't do it yet, then here's another opportunity. Think about one thing that you could do um, to improve your walk with Christ. So like I said, many facets, but it's all still encompassed in the one thing. So the first one thing that we're going to look at is the most important thing, and that is devotion to Christ himself. All of these things have to do with Jesus Christ, and we're going to look at them as we go through this. But the first one is devotion to Christ himself. If you look in Philippians 3 and verse 13, Philippians 3.13, the context here is Paul's devotion to Christ, and we'll look at that as we, as we look at the verses surrounding it here in a minute. Philippians 3.13, Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. He had his mind focused on one thing. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So he didn't have his mind focused on the many things that we talked about last Sunday, but on one thing. Because if you think about it, you can really only focus on one thing at a time, can't you? You ever try to do numerous things at the same time, especially things that require focus and energy and, and, and concentrated thought? You can't do more than one thing. So if your life is focused on a whole bunch of different areas equally, you're not going to do any of those things very well. But if your life is focused on one thing, and then that one thing leads you to focus on little tributary things that folk that lead into that one thing, then your life is going to be, it's going to have good focus. And that's what Paul had. He was focused on that one thing, to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Christianity, or Christian life, is, it's a race. Paul described it as such. And if we are going to win the race, that we're racing against ourselves, basically, we're going to keep our eyes fixed on the prize. Have you ever done any running before anybody ever ran? Well, you you focus on that finish line, right? Because sometimes when you get towards the end of the race, especially, it's when it's the hardest. And I know in my days in running, I would focus on the finish line and and just keep staring at it and keep thinking, I got to make it there. I have to make it there. And I'm not going to stop until I make it. And your Christian life is the same way. Paul forgot those things in his past. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. We've all got a lot of baggage in our lives. We all have various things in our past that we regret, things that that still tag along with us and things that cause us heartache and cause us trouble and, and destructive thoughts that we have and ideas that keep bringing us down. But Paul said that he forgot those things in the past. We've been through hard times, but we should forget about them. We should focus today on serving Christ. Forget about whatever was in the past and start here in the present and look towards the prize and focus on that. Focus on serving Jesus Christ today. Doesn't matter what yesterday is. Yesterday really has nothing to do with today. Yesterday can bring down today, but yesterday doesn't have to bring down today. You can forget, you can choose to forget what happened yesterday and start afresh today. You can do that. It's not easy, but you can do that. You don't have to be a victim of yesterday. You don't have to be a victim of your upbringing, of how your parents raised you, or 
things that happen to you, you don't have to be. You can forget that stuff and move forward today. And that's what Paul did. Because if there was ever a man that had a lot of baggage in his past, think about what Paul had to carry with him. Think about if you had spent years of your life persecuting and murdering Christians and hailing them off to prison and destroying their lives. Think about that. You could let that ruin the rest of your life. But he didn't. He forgot those things which were before. And he pressed towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He considered his previous life dung. All those things, all of his accomplishments. He was, he was a very accomplished man. We read about that here um, in the call to worship this morning. And I'll just go ahead and read it again for you, just to summarize his accomplishments here and to show you what he counted but dung. He said in verse 4, Philippians 3, 4, Though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. See, the Jews were big in trusting in their flesh. That's where their confidence was, in their circumcision and their pedigree and the fact that they were Jewish and what tribe they were from and so on. He says, you guys think you got room to brag? I got more, and I, I will show you. Circumcised the eighth day, right according to the letter of the law, of the stock of Israel, best nation on earth, right? God's nation. Of the tribe of Benjamin, right? A peculiar tribe, a, a special tribe. And Hebrew of the Hebrews. So when it came to the Jews, he was the best of the best, right? He was, he was the cream of the crop. It's touching the law a Pharisee. It didn't get any better than Paul. Paul was a studier of the law. Paul was a keeper of the law. Paul was blameless in the law, he said, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Paul not only was a Pharisee, but he practiced what he preached. And he thought these Christians were idolaters who needed to be punished. And he didn't just sit by and let somebody else do it. He took it into his own hands and he went out and made it happen. He was wrong, but he was sincerely wrong. Right? He said in Acts 24 and verse 9, I think it is. He said, I, or 26, 9 possibly. He said, I verily thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He really thought he was doing the right thing. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Nobody could point to a commandment and say, Paul, you broke that one. Now, he was guilty of all kinds of heart sins, as he later found out, or as he, I guess, earlier than this found out. Um, later on in his life, he found out in Romans chapter 7 that he was guilty of covetousness, and he said that sin wrought in him all manner of concupiscence. So he was guilty of all kinds of heart sins, but outwardly, nobody could say, hey, you've broken this commandment and censure him for it. He was blameless in the law. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ? So all this Jewishness stuff, all his circumcision, his being from a particular tribe, him being a Pharisee or a Hebrew, the Hebrew, a Pharisee, all of his education, all of his prestige, all of his profiting that he did in the Jews' religion above many his equals, he said, all that stuff he counted loss for Christ. He realizes, you know what, I just wasted a big chunk of my life. I thought I was doing the right thing, but I wasted my life. But he didn't sit there and sulk about it and and let, the re- let that bring him down for the rest of his life and just say, oh, I'm a failure, I really messed up. No, he focused on the prize and continued pressing toward it. He says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He didn't say that he counted it all lost for the excellency of being the chiefest of the apostles. He didn't say, well, it was all worth it because now I'm the cream of the crop again. right? I was the top Pharisee, now I'm the top apostle. I turned the world upside down. And he did, pretty much single-handedly. But that's not what he counted all things but lost for. It wasn't worth it because now I'm the best out there. right? Now I'm the guy that everybody thinks of when they think of Christianity. No. What he was happy about and what he was willing to lose his previous life for was just simply the knowledge of Christ Jesus his Lord. And guess what? Every one of us can have Paul's knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord. All you got to do is just read his letters. Read the Bible. Read it and study it. You can have the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord too. The more you study it, 
the more you'll know of Christ. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you and myself to do this morning. Paul was willing to give up everything in his previous life for that one thing, for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And ask yourselves, is it worth giving up everything in my life to have the knowledge of Christ? I think so. I definitely think so. It's been worth it in my life. I've lost a lot for it. Now, I wouldn't I wouldn't make another I wouldn't make a different decision if I had it all to do over again. He says, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul recognized that his salvation was not due to his own righteousness. It wasn't due to all that keeping the law that he did as a Pharisee, and it wasn't due to any keeping of the law that he would do as a Christian. It was due to the faith of Jesus Christ wasn't Paul's faith in Christ that made him righteous. It was Christ's faith that made Paul righteous. Right? It was Christ's faith to go to the cross. Christ's faith to live out a perfect life and trust God that he would raise him from the dead whenever he died at the hand of sinners. It was Christ's faith in, that, in his work that he did that saved Paul and saved you and I. Or you and me. Me. Yeah, didn't save I, you saved me. Yeah, saved you and me. There you go. Get a little grammar lesson for the day, too. <clears throat> Above all else, Paul wanted to know Jesus Christ. Verse 10, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. That was Paul's life goal, to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. And that is when you really get to know Jesus Christ. Whenever you have fellowship with his sufferings, whenever you suffer like Christ suffered. Now, we're never going to suffer to the degree that Christ suffered, obviously. The only way that we could ever do that is go to the lake of fire for all eternity. And I don't think anybody wants to do that. And you wouldn't be experiencing fellowship with Jesus Christ down there. I can tell you that. But you can experience fellowship with Christ whenever you have fellowship with his sufferings. Whenever you suffer as a Christian, you are having fellowship with Christ. Because you're meeting him right where he was. Because he came to this earth to suffer. He came to this earth to live out the law of God, to fulfill the law of God, and to suffer under the law of God for sinners. And whenever you suffer for your faith like Christ suffered, you are having fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's when you can really get to know somebody when you are in the trenches with them. You don't really get to know somebody just by seeing them occasionally, having small talk with them. But whenever you get down there in the trenches with somebody and you go through what they're going through with them, then you really get to know somebody. And that's what Paul wanted. It was worth it to suffer to get closer to Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 5. Paul says, for, the suffering, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So when you suffer, when you, when you suffer similar things like Christ did, being hated of men, right, being disrespected and mistreated, being cast out from their company, right, those kind of things, or physical, in Paul's case, physical suffering, beaten with rods thrice, 40 stripes, save one five times he received from the Jews, and so on. When you suffer like that, then you are having fellowship with Christ, and you have consolation from Christ, right? You get comfort from Christ whenever you suffer with him like that. And this is going to happen to anybody who is a follower of Christ. Look at John 15 and verse 20. The closer you are to Jesus Christ, the more you're going to suffer. Now, at the Seems counterintuitive. We would think in our human nature that the closer we are to Jesus Christ, the more he's going to protect us, the more he's going to make our lives wonderful. The richer we're going to be, the happier we're going to be. We're going to have perfect families. We're going to have perfect jobs. Everything's going to be great. We're going to be happy all the time. It's not true. The closer you get to him, the more you're going to suffer. 
He's a man of sorrows. And if you're going to get close to him, you're going to be one too. And that's a choice everybody has to make. Some people might not like that idea. Some people may choose to stand off a little bit, not get so close, because they don't want to suffer. But if you're like Paul, you want to enjoy the fellowship of his sufferings. You want to be drawn close to him. That's whenever Christ really comes in and gives you that hug and gives you that consolation and lets you know that you're one of his and comforts you whenever you suffer like he does, like he did. In John 15 and verse 20, Jesus said to the disciples, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also, they will keep yours also. We're not greater than he is. If he suffered, well, we're going to suffer too, right? If we do what he did, if we live lives, lives beyond reproach, if we live lives that expose wickedness out there, and if we're not afraid to speak against the wickedness out there, we are going to suffer for it. Now, if we're afraid and we put our candle, candle under a bushel and we never say anything to anybody and keep our head down, then you're not going to suffer. And if you don't want to suffer, just keep your mouth shut. Never tell anybody what you believe and just go about as a private person. You won't suffer and you won't be very close to Christ either. So it's up to you. It depends on how, how close you want to get. I'm not encouraging foolishness. I'm not encouraging being stupid and going out there and just trying to irritate everybody you meet or trying to make people mad or you know, trying to put a target on your chest. I'm not saying that. But you know what? When things need to be said, they need to be said. And we should say them. We should be like-minded like Paul was. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15. I think politeness has killed Christianity. We're all too polite these days. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want to speak out against sin. We just kind of keep our mouths shut about it. And, and that's probably why we're in the situation that we're in, because nobody speaks out against anything anymore. Everybody just goes along to get along. Philippians 3 and verse 15, Paul says, Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So Paul says if you want to be perfect, you want to be thus minded, you want to think like Paul thought, you want to forget those things which are behind, you want to press toward the mark, you want to know Christ no matter what at all cost, we should be thus minded. And you can tell by the focus of Paul's preaching what his first love was. What the, what his, the most important in his, thing in his life was, you could tell by what he preached about. If you look in second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, he said that he was determined not to know anything else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's a lot of things out there to know. A lot of interesting things. I mean, there's all kinds of things that I'd like to know and like to study about that I don't have time to. But you know what? The most important thing is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the most important thing to focus on. And you know what? If you get to heaven and you don't really know much about molecular, molecular biology or astrophysics, God's not going to chasten you for that. He's not going to say, you know what? You really wasted your time down there. But if you get there and you've got chapters of the Bible memorized, you know what God's going to say? I think. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The Lord doesn't care about our earthly wisdom. He cares about us knowing him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, of course, we have to compare this with what else Paul said. He also said that he did not shun to declare unto them, all the counsel of God. So, of course, there is a whole Bible that needs to be preached here, and there's all kinds of things. They all tie into Christ in some way, 
but you could do it. There's a lot of preaching that would be done that wouldn't be speaking specifically about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, right? So there is a lot that needs to be taught in this Bible, of course, without every sermon being on the crucifixion of Christ, right, or on the life of Jesus Christ. But that should be our focus. That should be our go-to whenever we look at other topics and we study out other topics and we go back to this. This is what we always ought to come back to. He didn't preach the wisdom of men. Verse 4. He says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I don't want my preaching to ever be enticing words of man's wisdom. I don't want to preach philosophy up here. I don't want to preach psychology up here. I want to preach the Word of God. And I want your faith to be in the Word of God, not in the Word of men. Not in my bright ideas, not in some other man's bright ideas, but in the Word of God. That's why the focus of my ministry has always been, and Lord willing, will always be the Word of God. When you look at my outlines, the majority of them have a lot of bold in them. And you know what the bold is in my outlines? Bible verses. There's always about 35 to 40 or 50 in most sermons. It's because these sermons are from the Word of God, as they should be. Paul didn't preach about himself. He preached about Christ Jesus the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. You want to stay away from the guy that preaches about himself. He's always telling stories about his life and promoting himself. Nothing wrong with mixing a little bit of personal information into a sermon. It helps your audience connect with you, I think, and see that you're a real person and that you've been through what they've been through. But that the focus of, of a man's sermon should not be himself. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 5 it says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul recognized the order of things. We preach Christ, and when we talk about ourselves, it's that we are the servants of Christ. Right? We serve him. He doesn't exist to serve us like Joel Olstein and the prosperity gospel preachers preach. We, we exist to serve him, not the other way around. Now, Paul had a lot of things that he could glory about, right? We read about some of them there in Philippians chapter 3, and and those were things in his previous life, right? But Paul had a lot of things to glory about in his current life. Turn to Galatians 6 and verse 14. A lot of things Paul could have gloried about. The most prolific Christian that ever lived. The most successful evangelist that ever lived went throughout the entire known world, and history has it, he even made it the whole way up to the British Isles, which I guess is part of the known world, but it's not even recorded in the Bible. But they say that he made it the whole way up there, and he talked about going to Spain in one of his epistles, and that's not recorded in the Bible that he ever went there, but he said that he planned to go there. Paul went all over the place, all through the world, and they said in Acts 17 and verse 6, I believe it was, that these have come hither, these that, have pre- these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. He had a lot that he could glory in, a lot that he could have boasted about. But here's what he gloried in. Galatians 6 and verse 14. He says, But God forbid that I should glory save, which means accept, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ be, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. That's the only thing that he was going to glory in. The only thing that he was going to be of exalted spirit about was the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation in Christ, the work of Christ on the cross, dying for our sins. That's what he gloried in. That's what we should all glory in. That's That's a glorious thing. You think about sovereign grace, the work that was done on the cross for you, which, by the way, 99% of the world does not understand, right? Most people, they don't understand it, right? Of course, people that are non-Christians, and there are billions of them out there, they don't have have a clue about it. And most of the people that call themselves Christians, the other billion out there, Catholics, you think they understand sovereign grace? 
You think most Protestants, at least these days, understand sovereign grace? They used to understand at least some, some, something close to it. Most people these days don't have a clue about sovereign grace. They don't understand that Jesus Christ by himself purged our sins. They don't understand that he shall save his people from their sins. They don't know that Christ did it all by himself, that he takes all the glory for it, that we had nothing to do with it. That's something to glory in right there. Paul, uh, the Lord said that let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor the rich man in his riches, but let him that glory, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. I tell you where the verse is, but I can't remember. I think it's in, in Jeremiah. That's what you glory in, though. Glory in our knowledge of the truth of our salvation. Now, here's another reason why we ought to be devoted to Christ himself. Think about this. Who do we admire? And I say we, I just mean people in general. Who do people in general admire typically? They admire rich people. They admire famous people. But they, you know who they also admire? Beautiful people, right? Don't we admire beautiful people? We all do. Everybody loves to look at a beautiful person, man or a woman. Well, guess what? Jesus is the most beautiful man ever. And I'm not just making that up, and I'm not just logically deducing that. I'll prove it to you. He didn't start out that way. When he came to this earth, he was not beautiful. And God made him that way on purpose for a reason. Look at Isaiah 53 in verse 2. Isaiah 53 in verse 2. I'll get to the verse here in a minute, which tells us that Jesus is beautiful, but I think that one gets overlooked, and because it's a little bit, it, it doesn't state it in such plain language, but when you, when you define the terms and you understand that this was spoken in prophecy, then we will we'll see that. Look at Isaiah 53 and verse 2. He wasn't beautiful whenever he came the first time. It says, For for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is a prophecy of the Messiah. This is nobody that, that has eyes or ears and can read or hear could possibly deny that this is a prophecy of the Messiah as you go down through it. It's quoted numerous times in the New Testament to show that these sufferings here are prophesying of the sufferings of Christ. And it was said of Christ there, He hath no form nor comeliness and no beauty that we should desire him. Comeliness is pleasing appearance, gracefulness or beauty of form, handsomeness. Christ was not a handsome man. You would think that Christ being the manifestation of God, you would think that he would have been a handsome man. Right? He would have been the, the most handsome, the most attractive man ever because he was God manifest in the flesh, but he wasn't. He was not a good-looking man. And there's a reason for that. It says there, right there in that, in that text, that we should desire him. He hath no, there is no beauty that we should desire him. God did not want a handsome man walking this earth that would have a following and a magnetism to him because he was so good-looking. He didn't want Jesus Christ to look like George Clooney or... Um, some other really handsome guy. You know, George Clooney, he's a handsome guy. And if Christ would have looked like that, he'd probably had a bigger following, right? But God didn't make him that way. But in his glorified state, it's a different story. Christ no longer has no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. In his glorified state now, he is more beautiful than anyone. Look at Psalm 45, verses 1 through 2. Psalm 45 verses 1 through 2. It says, My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Whoever he's talking about here is fairer than the children of men. Fair is beautiful to the eye of pleasing form or appearance, good-looking. So whoever the psalmist is speaking of here is more good-looking, more beautiful and pleasing to the eyes than any other children of men. 
Now let's keep reading and let's see if we can figure out who this is speaking of. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty. That kind of tips it off there for you, doesn't it? In thy glo- with thy glory, in thy majesty, and in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. What was it said of Jesus Christ that, that uh, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ? Wasn't it, didn't, didn't Jesus say that I am meek and lowly in heart? Right? Wasn't Jesus called meek and brought truth? Thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp. In the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. What what does the word Christ mean? It means the anointed one, right? God anointed him. He says, Thy throne, O God is forever and ever. And he says, Therefore God thy God hath, hath anointed thee. So here you have God anointing God. Now who could this be speaking of? Who is God that was anointed by God? Jesus Christ. Now we could reason that out, or else you could just go over to Hebrews 1, 8 and 9, where it says, Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is a... How do you say it? Scepter, the scepter is a scepter, or is a right scepter. i got to go over there and... Get that. I had the, the, the quote there in Psalms isn't exactly the same, and then it had the wording messed up in my head now. Under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Under the sun he saith, to the Son of God. So, the point is, Psalm 45 is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Now, in Isaiah 53, 2, we're told that he was not beautiful. In Psalm 45, 2, we're told that he is beautiful. How can he be not beautiful and, beautiful and most beautiful at the same time? In his exalted, resurrected state. Whenever he's at the right hand of God in heaven, ruling and reigning, he is the most beautiful man that's ever lived. I can't wait to get there and see him there someday. He's been there for 2,000 years, but he's not all wrinkly and gray-headed. He still has the dew of his youth 2,000 years later. Look at Psalm 110, verses 3 through 4. He's been a 33-year-old man for 2,000 years. Psalm 110, 3 through 4. It says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Talking about Jesus Christ. Clearly, he has the dew of his youth. So that's one reason why he's worthy of our admiration. Another reason why he's worthy of our worship and admiration is because he's our Lord and Master. Look at John 13, 13 through 14. This is why, if there's one thing that you should focus your life on, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is just that, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our master. John 13, 13 through 14. This is whenever Jesus had just finished washing the disciples' feet. He says, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. Master and Lord. That means he's our sovereign. He's our teacher. He's our authority. He's our supreme authority. He's our king. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought to, ye ought, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus said. So he reasons there. If I am the sovereign ruler of this universe, and I've done something and told you you ought to do it, well then you ought to do it too, right? He's the blessed and only potentate. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 15 through 16. 1 Timothy 6, 15 through 16. No king but Jesus, right? The Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. Us Christians say, we have no king but Jesus. Caesar's not my king. 1 Timothy 6, 
15 through 16. Which in his times he shall show. Means he's going to become visible. He's coming back. Who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. So he's the king. He's the prince. The Bible elsewhere says in Revelation, he's the prince of the kings of the earth. The king of kings. They all will bow down at his feet. Isn't that what it says in Psalm 2 and verse 10? It says that um, to kiss the son lest he be angry. And it says to... Um, trying to think of how it, how it puts that in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. This is, this is the verse I was thinking of. Verse 10, Psalm 2.10, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. The kings of the earth and the judges of the earth bow down to the Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And they don't right now. They hate him right now. But they will bow down. There's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They're all going to bow down. Trump, Obama, Bush, all the kings of the earth, they're all going to bow down and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the real king, the real blessed and only potentate, the real chosen one. Potentate is a person endowed with independent power, a prince, monarch, ruler. He's the only one, the only one that has independent power. Jesus derives his power from nobody else. Every other king, every other person derives their power from somebody else, either from a superior or from the people themselves that haven't overthrown them yet, right? The power of the king is in the people. That's a very terrible paraphrase in in Proverbs, but Proverbs talks about that, that I can't remember the exact quote right now. Um, eh, Anyway, I could get it, but I'd have to look for it for a second. But anyway, all powers derive their power from somebody. Jesus Christ derives his from nobody. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is endowed with independent power. So therefore we owe him our obedience. I think that probably goes without saying. John 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Right? And look at 1 John 2, 5 through 3 through 5. 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Now, if you love him, you should keep his commandments willingly. But if you're not a stupid fool, you should keep him anyway because you're going to be in trouble because he's a blessed and only potentate and he will do whatever he wants and you are going to suffer for it if you don't obey him. 1 John 3, 2, pardon me, 1 John 2, 3 through 5. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So if you know him, and you claim to know him, then you better keep his commandments. You better do what he says. And if you don't do what he says, you know what Jesus said? He said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That would make us a hypocrite if we claim to be under the lordship of Christ and yet we just do whatever we feel like doing. We don't listen to what he tells us to do. Now, another reason why Jesus should be our chief devotion is because he saved us from our sins. Remember what it said, what was said of him in Matthew 1 and verse 21? This was said to Joseph whenever he was told the name that he was supposed to give the baby that was born to Mary. He says there in Matthew 121, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So much in that verse. His name should be called Jesus. His name shall not be called Yahshua, Yahushua, or these other Hebrew names. The New Testament was written in what language? Greek. 
Greek. The New Testament wasn't written in Hebrew. This Hebrew roots movement thing, and you're going to run across these people all over the place online, would tell you that his name's not Jesus. His name is Yah- Yahushua or Yahashua or whatever, they, some Hebrew word. That's not his name. His name was written in Greek. It's Jesus. That's the, the, the English rendering of it is from the Greek word that is Jesus. It's crazy. Even the name of Jesus is under attack today by these supposed Christians out there that want to get you to use another name for him so you don't even know who he is. His name should be called Jesus. And there's a reason for that. For he shall save his people from their sins. So much in one little verse. He, who's going to do it? Who's going to do the saving? He, right? He's going to do it, not you, not the preacher, not me, not, not anybody else, right? Not Billy Graham, not the, not the tract writers, not the soul winners. He shall, not might, not could, not wants to, hopes to, give it a shot, see what he can do. He shall save, not offer, He shall do it. He shall save his people, not the whole human race, not those that put their faith and trust in him only, or not anything like that. He shall save his people from their sins, not from their poverty, right? Not from their crappy life, not from their problems, from their sins. There's so much preaching in that verse. I could could literally preach an entire sermon. I think I actually have. I'm pretty sure I have preached the whole sermon on on that very verse. But anyway, a lot of preaching in that verse. That verse pretty much just destroys most false doctrine out there in one verse. Hebrew roots movement can't make it through it. Arminianism certainly can't make it through it. Look at Revelation 1 and verse 5. Revelation 1 and verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, And the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus loved us. That's why he washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's why he came to this earth to die for us because he loved us. And the reason he loved us is because he chose to love us. He didn't love us just like you see a cute little puppy and you just can't hardly help but love the thing, right? That's not why he loved us. We weren't cute little puppies. Right? We were vile sinners. He chose to love us. We were that dead baby in the field. Ezekiel 16, you remember that passage where the Lord finds the dead baby in the field? It's covered in blood and filthiness. And the Lord picks it up and washes it and cleans it and swaddles it and tells it to live, and gives it life. That's what we were, the dead baby in the field not the cute little one that's already been washed up and is giggling. That's not what we were when Christ decided to die for us. So we, we therefore owe him our worship and devotion. If he saved us from our sins, from an eternity in hell and the lake of fire, we owe him our worship. If any other reason is not enough, that one certainly is. And he will be the object of our worship for all eternity because he redeemed us. Look at Revelation 5, 9 through 14. Revelation 5, 9 through 14. It says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That verse right there tells us that, number one, that sovereign grace is particular that he doesn't save everybody, but he saves people out of, right, just parts of all those nations. But it also tells us that it has nothing to do with our works, and it tells us that indirectly, because if he saved people from every people and tongue and nation, well, that includes nations prior to the gospel ever coming. That includes nations prior to Christ ever coming, right? The Amorites and the Moabites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the... Aztecs and the Mayans and the Aborigines, every nation, every people, every tongue, Christ has redeemed. And many, many of those people never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. And yet he redeems people out of every tongue, kindred, people, and nation. A lot of preaching in that verse too. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and and we shall reign on the earth. 
And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. That's a hundred million angels and millions more on top of that. If you just do the little bit of math right there. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That's why he's worthy, because he died for our sins as the Messiah. He's worthy of all those things. And every creature which is in heaven, that's the redeemed already that have died and gone on, and on earth, that's us down here right now, and under the earth, the ones that have died already and gone on. And such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and upon the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. That was going on 2,000 years ago. It's still going on now, and it will go on forever. And we're going to be up there as part of that, personally, whenever we die. And I really look forward to that. I mean, if you think, if you like church now, you're really going to like church up there. It's really going to be something. Now, the purpose, we just talked about Jesus dying for our sins and giving us eternal life. And the reason he did that is so that we can know him and that we can know the Father. Look at John 17 and verse 3. John 17 and verse 3. He didn't do that for our benefit only. I mean, we we definitely got a benefit out of that, obviously. But it wasn't for our benefit that he did that. You know why he created us? You know why he redeemed us? For his pleasure. That's what it says in, in Revelation. For his treasure, for his treasure, treasure, pleasure, we are and were created. Let's get that um, Revelation four eleven. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive power, our glory, pardon me, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God created all things, everything you see on this earth for his own pleasure. He created human beings for his own pleasure. And guess what? What are we called? We are a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. That means that he created the new man within us for his own pleasure. That's why he redeemed us, not for our sakes, for his. He created us, he redeemed us so that we can know him. John 17 and verse 3, Jesus says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus came to give him eternal life. That's what he said there. God had given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And he defines for us eternal life. This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's why he gave us eternal life, to know him. And then look at 1 John 5 and verse 20. 1 John 5 and verse 20. Now think about the absurdity of people out there that think, and there are people out there that believe this, that I've been saved by grace, therefore I'm going to live however I want. Think about the absurdity of that. He didn't save you so you can live however you want. He saved you so you can know Him and worship Him. That's why God and Christ saved you. 1 John 5 and verse 20, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true that we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Christ gave us an understanding which comes through regeneration so that we can know the true God. Jesus Christ is the true God. The Father is the true God. And knowing Christ passes all other knowledge. Ephesians 3 and verse 19. The most important thing you can know. Time reading the Bible is never time that is not well spent. Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. It passes, it surpasses all other knowledge. We should be like the Greeks who came to that feast in John chapter 12. 
John chapter 12 and verse 21. Kind of a passage that gets overlooked, but it's kind of profound if you think about it. John chapter 12 and verse 21. It says, The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. That's what we should all be saying. Sir, we would see Jesus. I would like to see Jesus. I'd like to see him with the eyes of my understanding now, and I would like to see him with my new eyes in my new body in the new heavens and the new earth. And I'd like to see him in my spirit whenever I die and go on before the resurrection. So I'd like to see him now and in heaven and in the new heaven and the new earth. So don't waste your life in the pursuit of other knowledge to the neglect of the knowledge of the Son of God our Savior. Of course, there's things that we have to know. We all have jobs and we have to know how to do our jobs and provide for ourselves and so on. There is knowledge that we have to get. There's knowledge that it's okay to get, right? Education is not a bad thing. But don't ever pursue any knowledge to the exclusion of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And especially don't pursue knowledge that is opposed to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you study, you kids, if you study science in school, like biology especially, they're going to teach you evolution. I'm virtually certain of it. You're going to hear that garbage in school. And you don't want to believe that stuff, right? You don't want to, you, you might have to write the right answers on the test, to, to pass the class, but you don't believe that stuff. You don't want to let them convince you of those lies because that stuff is, that's science falsely so called. You don't ever want to believe anything that's contrary to what the Bible says, as evolution is. Now, the other, the next one thing, is devotion to Christ's church. Look at Psalm 27 and verse 4. Now, the, the, the second flows out of the first. If you're devoted to Jesus Christ, you are, if truly devoted to Jesus Christ, you are going to be devoted to his church. Look at Psalm 27 and verse 4. Psalm 27 and verse 4. That's Proverbs 27.4. It said, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. And I didn't think that had much to do with the, the church. But I know there shouldn't be anger and wrath anyway and envy in the church. Psalm 27 and verse 4. One thing, one thing, David says here. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David says, one thing. One thing have I desired. There were many desires that David could have had. David was the king of Israel. And David could have pretty much had anything he wanted. right? And Solomon, his son, unwisely, pretty much did go after all of his heart's desire. And he had it all. He had riches. He had women. He had military might. He had everything. But David said that he had just one thing that he desired of the Lord and that he was seeking after. He was the one that wrote Psalm 27. You can see that right there at the beginning of the psalm. David was a man after God's own heart. You remember that? Look at Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. So if you want to be like David, be like a man after God's own heart, if you want to think like God, in other words, well then follow what David said. Acts 13 and verse 22 Says and when he this is just a little history of Israel here that Stephen's or that Paul's giving, pardon me. And when he had removed him and he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So here's a man after God's own heart, and he says, One thing do I desire, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He desired this thing. To desire is to have a strong wish for, to long for, covet or crave. David's one wish was, I want to be in the church. Right? That's what I want. If, above anything else, I want to be in God's house. So to desire something is to apply the heart and mind toward it. Okay? So he said, one thing have I desired, and then he also said, that will I seek 
after. So remember that. Just remember that. We'll get back to that. To desire is to, to, pl- to apply the heart and mind, right? But then he said, that also will I seek after. To seek is to go in search or quest of, to try to find, look for, either a particular object, person, thing, or place, like the house of God, whose whereabouts are unknown, or an indefinite object suitable for a particular purpose. So when you seek something, you go out and you search for it. You, you go out on a quest for it. So to seek something is to apply the will towards it. To desire is to apply the heart and the mind towards it. To seek is to apply the will because it takes willpower to seek. Because it's not just something that you sit around and think about. Then you use your will to force you to go out and look for it. Right? So he was using his heart, his mind, and his will to find the house of God. That was the one thing that he longed for and looked for was the house of God. Now that the house of God is the church of the living God, right? David was talking about the house of God. That was the Old Testament house of God. That was the temple, the tabernacle, first of all, then the temple. It's the place where God dwell, dwelt, right? Well, the, the, the God's church has been reformed, right? And now the temple of God is the church. It's not the physical building anymore. It's a building built with lively stones, as we re- read about in First Peter chapter 2. But if you go over there in First Timothy 3 and verse 15, I'll just give you a quick verse to show you that the house of God on this side of the cross is the church of the living God. And this is what we should likewise be seeking after and desiring, just like David did. First Timothy 3 and verse 15. Paul says, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The truth is held up by the church, right? The church is the pillar that holds up the truth. And there we have a definition of the house of God. Remember, that's what David was seeking, the one thing, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. It's the thing that you're sitting in right now. That's the house of God. The church of God is his kingdom on this earth. You remember what Jesus said whenever he said he would build the church? He said in Matthew 16, 18 through 19. Matthew 16, 18 through 19. He says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter's not the rock that Christ built the church on. I know I've said this before. Jesus Christ is the rock that he built the church on. Right? Doesn't it say that the church is founded upon Jesus Christ, the chief corner stone? The apostles and prophets are stones set upon that. Right? Jesus is the rock. And here's a great cross reference. I don't know if, if I, I know I've given this to you before. I don't know if you remembered it or not. But remember what Jesus said about the temple. He said it, I think it was in John chapter 2. He said, Destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. Destroy this temple, I'll raise it up again in three days. And then it says, but he spake of the temple of his body. He was referring to his body, and he refers to it as this temple, right? When he says, upon this rock will I build my church, he's referring to himself. When he said this temple, he's referring to himself. So you can use language like that to refer to oneself, and that's what he was doing. And then look at the connection here in verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So in connection with building his church, he says, I'm going to give thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the church and the kingdom are one and the same thing. And I've proved this to you numerous times and ways. But just one more, and we're not even going to go there. I think we went there last Sunday. In Luke 22 29 through 30, Jesus said to the apostles, I appoint unto you a kingdom that ye may eat and drink with me at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember that? You remember that verse? We've been over that numerous times. He says, I give you, I appoint unto you a kingdom that ye may eat and drink with me at my table in my kingdom. And of course, the question is, where do we eat and drink with Christ at his table? In his church, it's called the Lord's table, right? It's called the communion service. Therefore, the communion has taken place in the kingdom. Therefore, the church is the kingdom. Now, the church slash kingdom must be sought for if it's to be found. Look at Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Sometimes, 
It just depends. Some people, God just kind of comes up and just slaps them upside the head with it, and there you are, right? And some people are really searching for it and seeking for it, looking for the truth. It just depends on, you know, God does things different ways with different people. I kind of look at myself as one that was, um, it was prophesied back there in Isaiah, I think it was Isaiah chapter 60. It was also in, in Romans chapter 10, but I'll go back there to Isaiah. This is kind of the verse that I think describes my conversion. Of course, I, I don't even need to tell you that I am not the fulfillment of this verse, clearly, but I'm just saying this reminds me of my conversion, just in case there was any um, confusion on that topic. Where is that verse? If I can find it, I might read it to you. He says, um, Isaiah 65 and verse 1, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. This was quoted by Paul referring to the Gentiles. The Lord was sought of them, that, that, or that he was found of them that sought him not, and they were used to bring the Jews um, uh, jealousy. But I think of that verse with my own conversion, because though I was seeking the Lord, I didn't. I wasn't really seeking the truth because I didn't know that. I didn't know that the truth was out there to be sought. I mean, I thought I was seeking the truth, but the real truth of the Word of God, I didn't even know it existed. I've said this before. I didn't even know the word election was in the Bible. Never heard the word before. Didn't even know what it meant. Never. never I, I didn't have an inkling of the concept of predestination. Didn't know that. Didn't even know what that word was. Absolutely pathetic. You grow up going to church for 20, I think it was 21 years at that point, and never heard the word election, never heard the word predestination, never knew about sovereign grace. It's just a shame. But anyway, the Lord comes along one day and just slaps him upside the head with it. That's how he did it. I was found of them that sought me not. But when God does that, when he slaps you upside the head with it, then you have a choice. Are you going to seek it now that you know it's out there? Or are you just going to let it go and just keep going along your merry way, right? Thank the Lord that he gave me the wisdom and the conviction to seek it out and to find it. Where was I? Oh, yeah, it has to, yeah oh, Matthew chapter 7. Kind of lost my train of thought there. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Jesus said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. It will be. God will give. He'll give it to you when you need it, when you ask for it. But you've got to seek it. You've got to ask for it. And if you don't ask for it, you're not going to find it. And then once you find it, that's when it's time to pay the price. Look at Matthew 13, 44 through 46. Matthew 13, Matthew 13, 44 through 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven, remember the local church, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, same thing. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That, those verses are near and dear to my heart because that's pretty much what I had to do to be part of the kingdom. To sell, figuratively speaking, all that I had to lose all that I had, or most of what I had, family and lands and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But that's what you got to do, and if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to give up all that you have to buy it, then you're probably not going to find it, and you're not going to end up being in it if it's not worth everything to you. Now, some people would just think that that's, you know, people out there, I mean, if they were just to kind of meander into this church service and hear me talking about this, they would 
think, okay, where's this kingdom you're talking about? Because I don't see it, right? And there's a reason they don't see it. Remember what Jesus said, except the man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God? They can't see it. They can't see the spiritual thing that we have here. I'll talk about that in just a second. But like, like I said there, this includes things like family, property, land, or anything else near and dear to us. Look at Luke chapter 18, 29 through 30. These are things that Christians over the centuries have had to give up to follow Jesus Christ. Even Christians in our own day, but especially Christians in the past, the joy, they said of the Jews, they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. People were dispossessed to their lands, houses burnt down, families killed, right? persecuted from one place to the other, and people literally lost everything to follow Jesus Christ. Nowadays, most people that call themselves Christians wouldn't be willing to lose anything. Goodness, they're not even, wor- they're not even willing to, to get up an hour or two early on a Sunday morning and get to church. They don't even want to do that. I mean, that's too much of a sacrifice for them. Luke eighteen twenty nine through 30. And he said unto them, they, because Peter wanted to know, we've left all and followed thee, what do we get? And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, or uh, for, I'm sorry, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. In, another, in one of the other gospels he says, for my sake. And in another gospel he says, for the gospel's sake. You put it all together, you must leave all those things, or at least be willing to. Some people, hey, I mean, you find a church five minutes down the road from you, and you don't have to leave your family, you don't have to leave your house, you don't, you know, there's, I mean, this is not everybody has to do all these things, but some people do. And, and I was one such person. But anyway, it's for Jesus Christ himself, it's for the gospel, and it's for the kingdom, for the church. All three things. We're told in Psalm 84 and verse 1 that God's churches are amiable. Look at Psalm 84 and verse 1. I never get tired of preaching about Jesus Christ and his church. Never do. Lord willing, I hope I never do. If I ever do, it means I've become a castaway and I am profitable for nothing. I am worthless and you need to get rid of me. Psalm 84 and verse 1. It says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. I think that's interesting. Thy tabernacles. There, there's, as far as I know, well, I guess there were, there were two tabernacles. There was the tabernacle of the Lord that Israel had, and then there was the tabernacle of David, which was actually a different tabernacle. The one that David set up, and it's called the tabernacle of David, was not the same tabernacle as the tabernacle of the Lord. I don't know if that's what he's referring to as tabernacles or not. But anyway... I think it's interesting that the New Testament church is the tabernacle of God, right? the dwelling place of God, and there are numerous churches in the New Testament, right? How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Amiable, when we're speaking of persons, is friendly, amicable, kind. It's also, uh, that's an obsolete definition, but it's also worthy to be loved, lovable, or lovely. So the psalmist is saying that God's tabernacles are lovely and lovable. In other words, apply this to the New Testament, uh, which you can easily do, and God's church is lovely and lovable. Now that's not saying that any of us here individually are lovely and lovable. There's only one person in this room that is lovely, and that's my wife. The rest of us are just kind of all average, right? (laughs) None of us are lovely and lovable, right? I mean, people don't come to this church and say, wow, that is the most good-looking bunch of people I've ever seen. They are just beautiful, right? Of course, that's not. You know, we individually are not lovely. And we corporately, as a group, it's not like we're just a lovely group. People come in here and think, wow, that's just the most lovely group of people I've ever seen in my life. We're just people, right? I think we're halfway decent people by the grace of God. You know, we try to be nice and all that, but we're just people, just people like anybody else. There's nothing special about this group of people, per se, Right? We're not lovely or lovable. It's not that. It's the spiritual body that God has put us in here. It's the spiritual body that God has formed us in. That's what's lovely and lovable. 
It's the body. It's the body of Christ, the church, the spiritual organism that is this group. That's what's lovely and what's lovable. That's why I say, but people, they can't see that. Right? Except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. People come in here and what do they see? They just see a group of just average Joes meeting together in some basement of some building and you know, some average at best preacher up here harping for an hour and people that are halfway decent singers trying to croak out a few hymns. I mean, that's what they see, right? They just see just a bunch of average, you know, just nothing, right? N- nothing special just a group of people, they don't see the spiritual body here. They don't see it for what it is. That's why they come and go, right? They go somewhere else. They go someplace else with a beautiful auditorium, right? And then they worship the holiness of beauty instead of the beauty of holiness. Our souls should long and faint for God's house. And here's something else to think of. This is maybe some kind of a a mathematical enigma, but the substance of this church is greater than the sum total of its parts. right? Because the sum total of its parts, you take every member and you put it together, and we're all pretty much worthless. But the spiritual body that we're comprised of is lovely and lovable, even though the individuals were were just people, nothing special. And that's the truth. Look at Psalm 84 and verse 4. Verse 2, pardon me. Psalm 84 and verse 2. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Longing and fainting for the courts of the Lord. The courts of the Lord is another uh, term that means the temple in that case, which is the counterpart of the New Testament church in the New Testament here. To long is to have a yearning desire, to long, it's to, uh, to have a yearning desire to wish earnestly, also to be restless or impatient till something is attained. That's what the psalmist was feeling there. This burning desire, this wish, he earnestly wants to have a part in the church. He wants to get back there again. He'd been there before and he wants to get back. You ever feel that way after you've been on vacation for a while? You want to get back? You want to get back to the church? He said that his heart fainteth. Right? Fainteth for the courts of the Lord. To faint is to lose heart or courage, be afraid, become depressed, give way, flag. Now it's, it says it's only archaic and biblical usage. It's to become faint, to grow weak or feeble, to decline. Let me ask you a question. If you were ever kept away from the local church for some reason, for a, for a length of time, would you be afraid and depressed? Because that's what those definitions mean, Right? Long and faint, especially faint, faint, to be depressed, right, to grow weak or feeble. Would you be afraid and depressed if you were kept away from the church for some reason? You're just hauled off some other place and you can't be in a local church anymore. You can't assemble with a local church anymore. Would you grow weak, become feeble, and decline? Or would you just be okay? Oh, no big deal. I'll get the sermons and listen to them or whatever. Yeah. Would you be depressed, afraid, grow weak, feeble, and decline. I would. I would. I can just imagine that I would. Take me away from being a resident member of a local church after I've been a resident member all these years and watch me decline, watch me get depressed, watch me become weak and feeble. That's why I don't ever want to be outside of a local church. I don't ever want to be a non-resident member again. I want to be a resident member all the days of my life. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. If something happens to the church that I'm a member of, I'm going to move to another one. That's what I did the last time and that's what I'd do again here if I had to. Thankfully, I don't see that as a problem. I don't see that as, as an issue here. But anything can happen. I mean, hey, you look at the churches in the Bible, and they were all faithful churches, and guess what? They ain't around anymore. Every church rises and falls. Every church will eventually die. But Lord willing, I hope that doesn't happen to this one. I hope this church stays faithful, and I hope I stay faithful. If we dwell in God's house, we are blessed. Psalm 84 and verse 4 says, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, 
they will be still praising thee. And the reason they're blessed is because this place is more valuable than any other place. He says there in Psalm 84 and verse 10, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. That's an open-ended statement there. It's better than a thousand. It's better than a thousand pieces of gold, right? It's better than a thousand mansions. It's better than a thousand vacations. It's better than a thousand anything. It's the best thing ever. So much so that it would be worth being a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I'd rather be a doorkeeper than to go out and live somewhere where I could make a lot of money. You know, than to go out and live on the left coast or something like that and live in Sodom and Gomorrah and make a pile of money and not be in the church. I'd rather be a doorkeeper here than to live in the tents of wickedness there. I was just, I told somebody here, I was just offered a job the other day. I met a guy and he's a, he goes to a, um, a big Baptist church somewhere down south of Kansas City. They only have, like, they, their, their membership is way down. They only have 2,000 now. And, uh, and he asked me how many we had, and I said 11. He said, 1,100? No, just 11. And so then he says that they, their pastor just left after seven years, and they're looking for a new pastor. He's like, you know, you, you should put in an application. And I said, no, I'm happy where I am. He's probably like, the heck's wrong with you? You just say 11, right? Not 1,100, 11,000? No, I'm happy where I am. I'd rather be a doorkeeper here than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I don't know what that church, I didn't look them up, but I'm just assuming they're a mega church, an Arminian, happy, clappy, crappy, whatever. And you know what? I'd rather be a doorkeeper here than be in something like that. And you know, if I was, God forbid, if I was ever excluded from the church and I'd be out of the ministry forever, which would be horrible, But if I was ever excluded, I would hope that I would come back and do my repentance and sit in the back. Sit in the back and be a doorkeeper in the house of God. I just hope that never happens. But I've seen people that that get out and they don't come back. And they could be a doorkeeper. Some people get out, they've, they've screwed up so bad and got themselves into a certain situation where they can't be a member again. But they could be a doorkeeper. You know, didn't, they didn't care. And I'll close with this. Psalm 87 and verse 2, God loves his house more than any other place on earth, more than your house or my house or any other place where we could be. Psalm 87 and verse 2. It says, The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Now some of those Jews probably had some pretty nice houses. In the days of the rebuilding, they were, um, they were, um, oh, what was it called there? In Haggai, they were, um, I'll have to go look it up. They were put, they were like wainscoting. Their, they were putting like wood paneling in their, in their houses and their ceilings. And um, I forget, I, I got to look it up now. I, I, it's going to drive me crazy. I can't remember what it was called. It was, uh, se- yes, yeah, sealed. In Haggai 1 and verse 4, he says, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Sealed means having the interior roof or walls overlaid or lined with wood, wainscoted. So these weren't little shacks that they were building. They were building some really nice houses. Right? So there might have been some really nice houses in Israel, but God says, you know what? I love, I love the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. God loves his house. This little room right here, Whenever this church is meeting in it, God loves this place better than any of our houses and better than any mansion that you could find around here. God thinks this place is more beautiful than any of those. And so do I. I would rather be here.